I've never really been shy about uh, standing up in front of people and making a fool of myself. When I was uh, five years old, I was uh, chosen by my teacher at the time to play Winnie the Pooh, uh, naturally. <laughs> I had given myself till, till my 30th birthday. Uh, I, I moved out to L.A. when I was about 25. And I figured if I, if I can't make it in, in five years, five legitimate years of trying to, to do this, then, then I figure the market has spoken and, and it's time to, to pack it up. Uh, and I made it in, you know, just, just under the wire, basically. <laughs> uh, in 1998, you were dropped by your agent, William Morris. Can you remember that conversation and what you well, did Well, they're no longer a company, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so who has the last laugh? <laughs> It was right around the time when I was set dressing softcore porn films. <laughs> First of all, there was no penetration. So <laughs> let's be honest here. Uh, but essentially, uh, yeah, I, got, I had to move furniture around sweaty, naked people. Uh, it wasn't a great job. But you had to get by, you had to make a living because you wanted to be an actor. <laughs> yes. I was at the bottom of, of everybody's list. I had, uh, I had auditioned and not gotten... Uh, seven other projects uh, that year, mm -hmm. uh, gone all the way to the end of the line and, and auditioned and auditioned and succeeded and succeeded and succeeded and then failed. So tell us about how you were cast as Don Draper then, Donald Draper. Um, how did you hear about the, the role? Um, I read the script, which I thought was the best script I'd ever read. Uh, movie, television, anything. I thought, this is, this is going to be great. I wonder what movie star they're going to put in it. So then I could maybe be part of it in the third season. I didn't even know the casting directors. The casting directors were out of New York City and were not familiar with me, had not met me before. So I had to come in and, uh, and sort of what they call pre-read, which seems weird. Uh, so what do you do? You, you read before you read, essentially. You read for the casting directors, and then if they like you, they'll bring you into the next level. Seven short auditions, and <laughs> a month and a half later, I got the part. And tell us about the moment when you found that you got the role. You were in Lyft, weren't you? I was. I was in New York City. I finally, like, and, and by this point I had essentially performed every piece of material in the pilot uh, for either Matt or Alan Taylor, the director, or various producers, and, and, and reading with other people who were cast. And, uh, and I finally got flown to New York City to meet the, the network executives. Uh, and there were four, three or four people that I had to sort of meet and talk to and impress somehow with my acting skills. You I must get to the point where you're like, then what more can I possibly do? I, Am I the right I, or wrong? It literally was. I, I looked through the script and I was like, well, I've done the entire script. So somewhere on tape you have the whole thing. Uh, please just say yes. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, so we, we, we walked around and they showed me around the, the network uh, offices and I said, well, this seems rather a lot to do for someone who didn't get the job, but okay. And, uh, and then we went across the street to a, to a hotel on the roof, and it was a beautiful sort of spring day in New York City, and we're having drinks, and, and I'm also thinking, like, no one has said you got the job yet, but free drinks. So uh, uh, <laughs> we finish our drinks, and we sort of look out at the city, and it's really beautiful, and, and still no one has really said anything. And, and uh, so we're going back downstairs, and I'm, I'm riding in the elevator, and the, the woman in charge finally leans over to me and says, you know, of course, you got the job. And I said, no, I didn't know that, but thank you very much. <laughs> so I had, a, I, had a very, I had a very good day. It was a very <laughs> it was a good, good day. good day. What did they brief you when, they, when you got the job and they, they told you about the character of Don and what, how they wanted him to be? Were there any kind of hard and fast rules or any kind of just a way of making you understand? No, Matt was very... Was very uh, it was about confidence, and it was about uh, assuredness. And it, because the whole first episode, basically, is, is this guy trying to come up with an idea, trying to come up with something, trying to come up with a new way to pitch something that's ultimately going to kill you. Uh, and, uh, and so the whole, the whole first episode was this guy is perfect, this guy is perfect, this guy is perfect, until the last 10 seconds of the, of the show. And, and so... That was basically all he said to me, and then and then I 
then after I got the job and after we shot the pilot, he told me the entire backstory, and I was like, oh my god, <laughs> <laughs> okay. <But> as <laughs> so an actor, then, just kind of rubbing your oh, hands. Oh yeah. yeah, I mean, I was like, my god, now we've now we've now we've turned into uh, it turned into a Dickens story all of a sudden, but. Uh, <laughs> Here we are. This is the thing, he's so kind of pathetic and so, you know, you hate him, you hate him, and then you're like, oh no, but everyone wants to save him, I guess. They make it <laughs> so complex. Um, he's kind of eaten alive, isn't he, all the time by wanting to forget and hide and run and just escape the past and then always looking forward. I is he a strong character or is he a weak character? What do you think? Uh, you know, I think, I think at the end of the day, he's a coward. And I think that's what, what we find out as as this as this show goes along, is if, when presented with difficulty, he tends to run away. I think people want to help. They want to figure. You know, you see a puppy on the street, you want to be like, "Oh, come here, you little thing." Uh, and I'm nothing if not an injured puppy. <laughs> <coughs> um, sick puppy, I think, is the a phrase. sick puppy. Maybe is the, <laughs> more uh, appropriate. Why do you think he is so such a reluctant father and husband? I think because he's fundamentally dishonest. Uh, about about who he is and what he is, and I think that you know this is something that <laughs> maybe years of therapy might help, but uh, I don't think he's got that in him, um, and so he, he has to make do the best he can, and I think that's a big part of what what Don's situation is, other than at work, uh, is he's trying to make do the best he can. You look like a hundred bucks, ready to go sweet talk some retail Jews. You were tough to take first thing in the morning, Pete. I've never had any complaints. Speaking of which, who's your little friend here? Oh, she's the new girl. You always get the new girl. Management gets all the perks. Where are you from, honey? Miss Deaver's secretarial school. Top notch. But I meant where are you from? Are you Amish or something? No, I'm from Brooklyn. Well, you're in the city now. Wouldn't be a sin for us to see your legs. And if you pull your waist in a little bit, you might look like a woman. Is that all, Mr. Draper? Hey. I'm not done here. I'm working my way up. That'll be all. Peggy, right? Yes. Oh, and it's time for your 11 o'clock meeting. Oh, and sorry about Mr. Campbell here. He left his manners back at the fraternity house. What wonderfully complex and fantastic character to be playing, though, um, in Donald Draper. Part of the, the brilliance, I think, of Mad Men is the way it's obviously depicting America in such changing times as the society um, is shifting. How did, did you research it, or how did you research it? In what way? Um, I, I had always been a bit of a, of, a, of a student of that time. I mean, it's, it's such a rich uh, time, not just in America, but certainly in the UK and, and, and France and, and the world, really. But uh, it was the precipice of a, of a significant uh, demographic shift. Um, and uh, what, what basically started happening was uh, the youth really began determining what was uh, important in culture. And uh, that really hadn't, hadn't happened to this extent before. And I think in setting the, uh, the show at the beginning of this shift uh, was, was create a pretty uh, unique dramatic opportunity to show not only a, a person who is go going to end up finding himself behind the times, but also setting up someone who's going to end up finding themselves uh, at, the, at the leading edge. And I think we have that in, in, uh, in the character of Peggy Olson. There, there just seems to be something between them. They're, they've got, both got secrets for a start. And so there is some kind of a bond between them. What, what do you think of their relationship? It's not a mistake that, that the whole series starts on Peggy's first day at work. Um, and... and uh, I think in many ways she is the character through whose eyes we see most of, uh, of the show. Um, and I think that, uh, that Don recognizes something in Peggy, an ambition, uh, a desire to become something else. Which he, he struggles with, presumably because she's a woman, to start off with, that I'd imagine that doesn't really sit well with him, to see that naked ambition and wanting to further yourself. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't know if he has a problem with it so much. Uh, I think, I think he appreciates ambition. This is a man who came from nothing and, and made himself into something uh, by hook or by crook. And I think that, uh, you know, in many ways, being from the, the sort of Depression era, uh, tiny, you know, tiny town mentality is not that dissimilar from being from Brooklyn and having to look at Manhattan every day and say, like, that's where I want to go. That's where I want to be. I want to make it there. And, uh, and I think that that, that 
relationship and that and that kinship that Don and Peggy both have, I think I think he considers it very special. Um, and there's no romantic uh, intertangling at all. I think it's it's simply a, a business relationship, and he recognizes that she's a valuable commodity. What's wrong? Elevator up. I think I just broke up with Mark. Oh. Really? I think so. So I'll go home. Nope. I'm ready to work. You win again. You could have just told me it was your birthday. Right, and there'd be no repercussions. So now this is my fault? Well, it's not my fault. You don't have a family or friends or anywhere else to go. Go. Go run to him, like in the movies. You don't have to be here. I do have to be here because of some stupid idea from Danny, who you had to hire because you stole his other stupid idea because you were drunk. Don't get personal because you didn't do your work. Isn't there a tale of um, you damaged your hand at one point? I was oh, reading God, I've been, I've been hurt more on this show than, than anything else I've ever done, which is weird. Uh, the, first, well, the first season, a piece of the wall fell and hit me on the head. Uh, I had seven stitches. It's not that funny. It hurt. <laughs> uh, and, uh, it's and obviously then, a very expensive set that walls just fall <laughs> over, obviously. Uh, and uh, yeah, I had to go to the hospital for that. And then, uh, and then season one or two, I forget what it was, I broke my hand uh, during a Korea flashback. There was an explosion and we were doing a rehearsal of it and I'm jumping through the thing and landing on this lovely soft cushion that they've put there for me. So I jump through and I land and instead of landing on the cushion, it, it sort of catches and I roll over and I hear my hand break. And that was on the rehearsal, which meant, of course, that I had to do it two more times. Uh, so uh, as I watched my hand sort of swell up into this odd shaped bear claw, I went over to the director and said, I'm pretty sure I broke my hand, so can we maybe get this in one? And he said, all right, yeah, well, we're gonna have to because we're, you know, we're setting off explosions. And I went, okay, well, good. Good to know. Peggy! Yes, Mr. Draper. Miss Olson, you are now a junior copywriter. Your first account will be delivering Clearasil to the spotted masses. What? Don't act surprised. Is this really happening? Yes, it is. My goodness. I will do my sincere best. Good to hear. Mr. Campbell here will brief you after the holiday. There's a scene in the first season where I promote Peggy to a copywriter, bring her in, congratulations, now you're a copywriter. And it's basically a giant due to the Pete Campbell character, but uh, it promotes her and hooray. So, uh, I, and she's supposed to shake my hand. And my hand is this grotesque swollen bear claw at this point, but I have a removable cast that I can I can uh, hide. You can actually see it. It's really funny if you watch. If you watch back episode twelve or thirteen or whatever it is of the first season, uh, there are certain shots where you can just. I look like I have a, a cartoon <laughs> hand. I mean, it's ridiculous. Um, and uh, so I say, okay, we're going to do this. And I said, you know, Lizzie, give me like a fake shake. Don't give me the real like heyo, uh, because I broke my hand. Um, yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. Um, so we do the scene, and I say, congratulations, you're a copywriter. And she goes, thank you, and puts her hand out, and I shake her hand, and she death grips my hand <laughs> so hard that lightning shot through my head. I hit my knees out of the frame. I literally hit the ground, and I was like, what did I just tell you? And her response was, I thought you were kidding. <laughs> <laughs> because of your reputation, you see. <laughs> Um, if there was another character within Magnum that you'd like to play, which one would that be? Which other Roger role? Sterling. Roger, he's a great character. He gets all the jokes. <laughs> he's got a great twinkle in his eyes. He, well. uh, he, we would go through scripts all the time uh, at read through and everything, and I'd be like, God damn, like, here's another great joke, here's another great joke, here's another great joke, and he would just look across the table and goes, you get to make out with her. <laughs> and I went, all right, fair enough. <laughs> he doesn't do too badly either. <laughs> no kidding, and jokes. <laughs> Um, how did you get to grips with the, the feminist issues in Mad Men? Because it's, it's quite breathtaking at times, the treatment of women, and obviously it changes throughout the series, throughout the seasons. Um, we, try to, we try to portray it as, as realistically as possible. I mean, these things, these, these attitudes were, were around, they were present. 
Uh, my mother was a secretary. That's how she met my dad. Um, she was a secretary to, to my, who t turned out to be my godfather. And my father went to visit uh, this guy and said, you know, basically like, who's the honey on your desk? And that was my mom. <laughs> and you know, four years later, out came I. <laughs> uh, so it, it was certainly part of the, of the culture. And, and we're, as, as surprising as it is now, just from the times we live in, uh, I don't know if the attitudes, have, the, the, the fundamental attitudes have, have changed. I think there's, there's quite clearly a, a, some sort of sexism that still exists in the world, if not the culture at large. But I think it's, it's uh, hidden better and not as, as widely uh, seen. I'm not interested in housewives. What kind of people do you want? I want your kind of people, Mr. Draper. People who don't care about coupons, whether or not they can afford it. People who are coming to the store because it is expensive. But we obviously have very different ideas. Yes, like the customer is always right. Gentlemen, I really thought you could do better than this. Sterling Cooper has a reputation for being innovative. Miss, you are way out of line. Don, please. Let's not get emotional here. There's no reason we can't talk this out. Talk about what? This silly idea that people are going to come to some store they've never been to because it's more expensive? It works for Chanel. Menken's is not Chanel. That's a vote of confidence. What I'm saying is Chanel is a very different kind of place. It's French, it's continental, it's... Not just another Jewish department store? Exactly. You were right, Roger. This place really runs on charm. This is ridiculous. Don. I'm not going to let a woman talk to me like this. This meeting is over. Good luck, Miss Macon. Which scenes have you found most grueling? Which of the bits that have really, really taken it out of you? Um, the emotional stuff is, is hard. Um, the, 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 the salesman stuff is, is a lot of words and a lot of kind of getting, getting things, getting a lot of information across very quickly and very confidently. But the, the emotional stuff is, is, is difficult because it's difficult. Um, uh, it's hard to go to that place and be and be that person uh, often, and not just the sort of weepy crybaby. Uh, the, the the angry stuff too is is hard to do. Mm. Is there any? Is uh, the one that Especially when you're out? staring at Elizabeth's face, who looks like, talk about a hurt puppy, um, and you're berating this poor person, um, who is a very good friend of mine and who I like very much. Uh, so it's hard to to get to those places of of sort of deep. Uh, seated emotion, um, but it's I think what enriches the ex ex enriches the experience. I'm not suggesting that what I do is uh, physically. I'm not a lead miner. Um, it's not like uh, it's not like the world's hardest job, uh, but it but it does take a, a lot of kind of mental focus for an extended period of time, uh, and there is of course a physical aspect to it. But um, it's 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 a lot of focus for a long time, and it's a lot, and it's a long season. It's not as long as some, but we don't have any any breaks, any weeks off or anything. It just goes straight through. So I'm pretty exhausted by the end of it, and I, and I don't have a lot of days off either. Uh, so it's 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 a well earned rest when I get to the end of it. Has the constant drinking and the uh, the smoking madman made you imbibe more in real life? I'm just wondering whether it's uh... the stress makes me imbibe more. The uh, the uh, the, the constant, you know, we, we, we drink water and smoke sort of, of leaves, um, just straw, and it's awful. It's, you're still basically lighting a fire and inhaling smoke, which is not, <laughs> I don't recommend. Um, but uh, but there's, they're, they're non-addictive. So, uh, no, I, I, I uh, no. <laughs> 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 the whole of the fourth season was was basically about breaking this this guy down and him being stripped of, of his family and his children and his house and his ability to work and his ability to do everything and, and combined with a serious uptake uh, uptick in his alcohol consumption and cigarettes and philandering and everything else. It's just a man uh, unmoored. And I think Don saw in Megan, you know, a uh, something to cling on to and something stable. And, uh, I, you know, I'm, uh, I'm an optimist at heart. I hope, 
I wish the best for those two crazy kids. It's going to be great. It's going to be okay. We'll see. <laughs> um, do you feel <laughs> hopeful for Don at all? Do you think that one day he will find happiness? I, I you know, again, I am an optimist. I think that, uh, I think that yes, uh, is the short answer. But I think that he needs to do some, some pretty serious work on it and, and, and try harder than he, than he has been. He doesn't seem able to do that for himself, though, does he? He's, I mean, he hasn't to this point so far. So does he need someone else to, to help save him? Yeah, probably. <laughs> and does he, do, does he ever redeem himself, do you think? Does he ever make amends? Will he? You know, I think, uh, I think that might be the part that we're getting to at this point, uh, is, is him trying to repair a lot of the relationships that he's, that he's broken. I'll be right back, Salamander. Daddy! I left my hat in the car. Get it later. I need to talk to you. How much have you filmed? What have you done so far? Uh, we've, we just finished uh, the fifth series, so it's, uh, we finished that in January. And, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll go, we're, we have two more seasons after that, six and seven, and then that will be that. You'll do what you give them, I guess. Yeah, I just, I just read the scripts in front of the camera, you guys. <laughs> um, yeah. You actually directed the third, third episode, was yes. it? Yeah. Um, tell us about that. Uh, it was a, it was a, eye-opening experience in many ways. It was a, uh, uh, it, it was a, it was sort of a, a look behind the curtain in many ways too. Uh, it was, it was uh, incredible to see. A completely different perspective of something that I thought I know so knew so well, um, and it was exhilarating, and it was a tremendous amount of fun, and uh, something I'd love to, to do again. But the, the reason I, I chose to do it this year, I had been asked a couple times before to, if I wanted to do it, and, and I always said no. Uh, this year, I just felt more comfortable than I ever have with the show, with the character, with my place in the world. And uh, I felt ready, ready to do it, and uh, and confident. And I think that that that's a big part of kind of running a set is being confident and being assured and knowing what you want to do, and and uh, and and confident enough to say, okay, we got it, let's move on. Uh, because I, as I said, we do we do shoot rather quickly, so it was. Uh, it was great fun. And did the other actors take your direction well? Did they give you a hard time? I hope so. Uh, they must have given you a hard time at some they point. They tried, and they failed. <laughs> uh, what kind of a director are you then to work with? I'm pretty laid back, uh, believe it or not. I'm, uh, I'm a fairly, I'm not a, I'm not a yeller, I'm not a screamer, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not that guy really in any part of my life. Uh, but uh, I, again, I felt, I felt very comfortable with, with my knowledge of these characters as well. And I think it was it was pretty easy to, to to direct people that are essentially my friends and 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 characters that I know pretty well as well. So hopefully further along the line you'll do some more more directing with this soon. I hope so. We'll see. Oh my goodness. Oh. It's beautiful. When I saw you sleeping there, I thought, I couldn't imagine not seeing you there every morning. Will you marry me? Do you have any regrets, anything that you've done that you've, uh, you've bitterly regretted? The set dressing days were not great. <laughs> Especially as people like me keep bringing it up over and but, over again but, as well, sorry. But the money was useful. I, I, don't have, I don't have a tremendous amount of regret in my life. I, I, I don't. You know, I've, I've lived a life, and uh, I, I, that's the only one I've lived, so I don't really have much to compare it to, but I, I, I feel like I'm in a pretty good place, and, uh, 
have, have done some things that I'm pretty proud of and, and, and I feel confident that there will be more, hopefully, in the future.